Welcome back to uh, another episode of the NoFX Podcast. Uh, you may notice that I'm here, and I'm Ms. Lane. I'm with the one host. Uh, the other host that's usually sitting over there, Kirk, uh, was a little indisposed, and uh, we decided that we wanted to talk about a deck that he didn't really have any um, experience with anyway. So live from some boiling tar pits with some <laughs> some funky goblins and whatnot. Uh, it's my sexy Jerry. goblin friend right here, yeah. <laughs> All right. What's up, Joey? What's up, everyone? Joey has been uh, on the podcast once before when we talked about Storm, and obviously is a stable on my stream, so you should know his face by now, uh, but you may not know the deck that we're talking about, because for whatever reason, um, yes, Modern Horizons 3 is the new set, it's uh, what everybody's talking about lately, but uh, this commander in particular hasn't really been seen in the chatter that uh, one of the other ones has, and um, I actually initially was thinking, well... Striker of the Iron's Hot, let's talk about uh, the big one, which was Nadu, uh, the Simic bird thing that does a lot of bouncy shit with lightning greaves and whatnots, and um, can be non-deterministic and piss people off, but uh, generally speaking is very powerful. Uh, it's quite popular at the moment. Uh, we've had gameplay videos and whatnot uh, already, and uh, they've been, again, pretty popular. But, like, we saw people talking about that all over the place, but we haven't really seen anybody talking about this commander. So, during our Modern Horizons 3 uh, stream, Joey played this commander in particular, and has played it since, and you've probably, maybe you're already sick of it, because it's been on the gameplay side of the channel uh, already a few times, but... A few times, yeah, three times, it is, I think, yeah. um, it, It's good, and it's strong, and it's consistent, and um, it's... Could be considered non-deterministic as well, but seems to pretty much get there almost every time you start, as long as there isn't any sort of way to stop it. I guess the same could be said about Nadu, but uh, just like Nadu, this one seems to uh, kind of reset itself and whatnot anyway. But instead of me talking about it up and down, backwards and forwards, let's have Joey talk about it a bit. So I have some questions lined up here, interview style, as we usually do. Uh, I will throw up some cards on the screen as we talk about them and uh hopefully you enjoy maybe you learn something uh so the commander yeah, in definitely. question which we'll throw up now is uh called ashling the flame dancer this is a mono red four four legendary elemental shaman for two generic two red it says you don't lose unspent red mana as steps and phases end it also has magecraft which is a, a mechanic that first popped up in strixhaven and we haven't really seen too much since then which cares about copies as well as most things only care about casting of spells this actually cares about the copies as well so this is whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell discard a card then draw a card, so it's a rummage. If this is the second time this ability has resolved this turn, Ashling Flame Dancer deals two damage to each opponent and each creature they control, so Pyroclasm. And if it's the third time, add four red, which, what is that? Seedling Song is five. Is there one that adds four red? I don't think there is. Or is there? No, there's not There's not an instant speed ritual that does that. The Desperate and the Pyretic both do three, three. two mana for three mana, yeah. Right. So basically, uh, every time you cast or copy a spell, you're going to get a rummage trigger. That is notable because initially we didn't know that that's exactly how it worked, and we figured that out later. But yeah, so it's very powerful. Lots of things stapled on one card for only four mana. It's a 4-4, four, four, so like it doesn't die to bolts and other things. So it's got that resiliency. It's also, I mean, 4-4 four, four is a good, good size beater if you need it. It does a lot of stuff here. So I guess the first question I have for you is, what drew you to Ashling, considering things like Nadu and other stuff from the set that are powerful exist? Like, why, why were you... Well, I know the answer to this question, probably, but let's let the audience <laughs> know why it was that you were attracted to Ashling. Well, I like I like Mono Red, and I'm, I'm sure you knew I was going to say that, but, you know, Mono Red is, uh, is my jam. I'm not a huge Magda player. Like, I do like the deck. I've, I've never really, like, piloted it myself. I like it, though. But I like a lot of like the stormy versions of, of mono red, like my my Sir Carolus, which has been on the channel. But yeah, the that like, you know, you're gonna you're gonna get there, you're not, and you're just gonna you know dig until you find something that can potentially get you there. I like that t style of deck, even though, you know, I know sometimes it's not the best to to play against. But I think if you have a feel for your deck, then you can go through it quickly and make sure you know that other people aren't suffering while you're you know jamming your thing. Yeah, I think that's notable. It is. Could be considered solitaire, uh, Nadu as well, and other. It's reminiscent of cards like you know Joyra back in the day with the uh, eggs and the, the one that we all, well at least I hate, uh, the Kraken Sakashima decks of the world. There are a lot of them that have these manual storm elements that 
you know, yes, if you're good at the deck, you know what to look for, and you know how to dig properly, you can kind of get to where you need to go. Uh, but then it does have that side effect of, yeah, everybody else is not playing Magic while they watch you fiddle with your deck until you get there. So it, it is the kind of thing that you need to be playing against uh, other mature adults that aren't going to bitch because you're taking forever. Yeah. yeah. But also, uh, and, you need to practice yeah. Yeah, you need you need to goldfish it a little bit, you know. I think that like goldfishing, especially with aggressive decks, is important. It's an important part of deck building. Is is you know, trying it out. Like you know, obviously, interaction can mess with you at any point, but knowing your lines is is important. And I think goldfishing does that for you. So, yeah, just uh, you know, take a couple hands, play them out for a few turns, and see where it goes. You know, you don't need to go past like turn four, but see see what happens with whatever hand you get and that's also that will also help you with mulligans and stuff which is which is huge so yeah i think that's a big part of playing a mono red storm deck know your lines know what's the easiest way to win and in what window storm in general really is knowing how to get yeah. there right so oh yeah yeah like and even nas lists and stuff like you know where you're not worried about the rest of the table you're just jamming your thing you're just going to go ahead and, and play your cards and see what happens yeah, those those kinds of decks, goldfish away. You know, practice them. Don't necessarily bust it out your LGS with randos, but uh, you know you're gonna have to do that eventually if you want to get reps in as well. Yeah. So, if you had to sell some on this list, what's the tagline? Like the thing that you would say, like uh, you know, outside of what you've already said, like if you had to like kind of encapsulate I mean, it, like to sell it to someone that would want to make them want to play it. The commander does so much. I mean, look at look at all the text on this thing. And and we talked like I kind of mentioned at the beginning that first ability looks really kind of like oh you know nobody ever uses that with Bergy, um, but with with Ashling you actually keep that for turns too. So it doesn't say this turn. So you get to keep that forever. You have all that mana for however long. If you have two mountains left over before you start to untap, you can tap that, float that, you have that your turn. It seems like such a small ability, but you can take advantage of it in this deck. You know, you, you need that little like extra bit of mana. You can make that happen. You know, hold up interaction, or you know, just float that into your next turn. Which is, I mean, that's just a huge thing that seems so small on the on that first ability. Um, and then you you know your three you know magecraft abilities are all good. You know, you're you're rummaging, so you're digging for what you want, uh, or you're you're doing two damage to everything, which gets rid of two of the main problems for the stick that would be huge issues if it wasn't for the two Getting damage. overrun by little things. Yeah. Well, well, the, yeah, that and Orcish Bowmasters and Dothy Voidwalker would both be, they would just shut this deck off. But because all we need to do is cast two instants of sorceries, they're gone. That's just a huge boon for the deck. We can we can really just, you know, play our game, even regardless of what's on the on the table. I mean, Outside of like white enchantments and stuff that yeah, can really Drannis slow us down. as well doesn't but, die to the Chalasm, but you could probably ping it with a grape shot. Correct. Right. Yeah, I'm running a lot of three damage spells, like like you know, obviously lightning bolts in in our win combat. We have like a lot. We are we are even running Galvanic Discharge, the new uh, one mana to damage one. to creature, just so that we can get rid of Drannis. And I think also like with a deck like this where you can run into cards twice because you are shuffling back in, like you know you clasmed on a turn and and you need to get rid of something with four toughness, so you use two of it and you have an extra energy laying around for later. And you run into Galvanic Discharge again. Okay, all of a sudden now you can do four damage to something. Like that's not going to happen that often. But you know no. that's why I chose it over any other one mana. You know do do a little bit of damage spell. Like I said, you see cards over and over again, or you can use stuff like like I have Past and Flames in the deck and and Invoke Calamity, where you you know you might cast a card again. So sure. So I mean, I guess in a nutshell, it is value town, but then also consistent. Uh, oh yeah, and we didn't even talk about the, the mana. Yeah, the, the the four mana on the third one. Yeah, so like everything you need to to storm off is is cards and mana, right? Like you need you obviously need a clear board, which we already talked about. The second trigger does that, and then you're rummaging every time, and you get mana. And that mana doesn't go away now. You know, it, it does kind of stack up when you look at the commander. There's so much text on it. And I think when you first read it, you're kind of blown away by how much it does. So you don't really see how it all stacks together the way it does. Having all three of the, those things, four of those things really stapled on the card is it's just a lot. Yeah. And plus it's a 4-4. Four, four, so, you know, if you're not attacking yeah. with it, nobody's attacking you. Right. At first glance, it it didn't seem like it was... I also think that I only thought that the rummage happened once and that was it. So, like, you get max three triggers off of it and then it's done. And if that was the case, it is, I think, less good. Not that it's bad, but just less good. Uh, yeah. Getting the rummage every single cast or copy is fucking nuts. 
I didn't see the one card combo with it, or the or even the the double copy spell combo that we're going to talk about like very shortly. That I didn't see that right away until Kirk actually showed it to me. So I was brewing the deck just purely as like a mono storm. Like, can I get to the cards that I need in order to win the game? However, it is kind of deck and he showed me like oh no you can just get this infinite magecraft triggers and and then all of a sudden you're looping your deck and you can do pretty much whatever you want as long as it's instant speed we'll talk about instant speed i'm sure a lot like later on when we talk about winning the game but this is kind of leading us into my next question which you've already kind of answered but you may be may have more cards to make examples of and or we can go into more in depth about the combos uh strengths of the deck obviously we already talked about the commander's strengths and the consistency that that brings but uh, what other cards are like in the 99 that are help, helping to add to that consistency and or push it to the level that it's at? There's a couple of weird includes, I think, that I like I definitely I discuss in because I, I did write a, a big detailed primer, which I'm sure, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll put the list in the in the description of this and everything. Yeah, but in, in the detailed primer, I have like I have inclusion, some some things that I really like. One of those is like a weird card that, you know, maybe not everybody who's playing Ashling is on this card. I, I would respect them if they didn't play it. It's it's not like I think an auto include, but it has performed really well for me. Uh, it's called Vial of Galadriel. It's a, basically a little bit of a slightly overpriced mana rock, but it has some some good text on it for us because like we're mono red, we're gonna we're gonna play our cards, and our our commander's ability is not card advantage. It's just you know, we're just digging. So it says if you would draw a card while you have no cards in hand, draw two cards instead. Right right there. Yeah, you can draw if you're if you're storming off with this card on the field you can really you can end up drawing six extra cards in a turn because you're just casting everything and you end up you know feeding this loop where you're okay i'm I'm, both of the cards in my hand are gone by the time i have a rummage trigger so i'm drawing two you know it just does a lot of work which you know when i first put it in, i was like this might be just kind of a cute include but it has worked Three mana, not ideal, obviously. Like, you don't want to pay three mana for your mana rocks, but it does tap for mana, and it does something else for us. So I think it is worth an include, and it does, like, when you get it on the field and you can put it to work, it does great things. Uh, The other thing, card that really was showed off in the last gameplay video was a card called Conspiracy Theorist, which is a card I had never seen before I started playing this deck. One in a red for a creature human shaman. It says whenever conspiracy theorist attacks, you may pay one and discard a card if you do draw a card. So it has its own rummage on it, kind of stapled on. But it also says whenever you discard one or more non-land cards, you may exile one of them from your graveyard. If you do, you may cast it this turn. So on every single rummage, we're discarding something, right? And may- maybe we want to cast that, but we just want we want the we want to draw a card as well. So we we throw that into the conspiracy theorist zone, and then we can cast that later. You know, uh, whatever it is. Um, this works really well with like Faithless Looting. Notably, if you're discarding two cards at the same time, you can only put one of them into the Conspiracy Theorist zone. So with Faithless Looting, you're going to have to choose which one. you know. Um, and if you're discarding a land, you can't put it in there, which is fine, because usually you want to throw those in the bin for Breach anyway, uh, right. in case you run into that. We like Breach. It's not it's not a combo piece in our deck, really, but it, we like it just for the, the pure recursion. Even though we're running a Shuffler, we do need to have a little bit of recursion. You know, we're not going to lean super hard into it. I think I have three slots dedicated to it right now, but we do want to have a little bit of it in there. I mean, Breach is never bad, even if it's value. It, right, yeah. Because it can it's not a combo cast piece in our deck. It's another just gamble, good. or it can cast you another whatever, so yeah. When we're constantly discarding cards, you know, Shuffle, Shuffle Titan's one card in our deck. We could have 20 cards in our bin before we, we see that thing. So, obviously, it's a numbers game. At some point, you're going to run into it, and sometimes early in the game. Could uh, have those cards as dead cards at some point. I think the, the benefits of them outweigh the, the cons, especially with a card like Invoke Calamity, but... Uh, Breach and, and Pass and Flames, both still very good. Yeah. Uh, I think when you're um, in Storm, too, because you've already cast a shitload of spells, hopefully by the time you see one of those cards, now you're getting them a second time, like you said earlier about, you know, that Galvanic uh, Discharge. You know, maybe you've already cast it once early, now you got Breach, you cast it again, you had some energy saved up, you know, now you can do yeah, a bigger thing, you, whatever. Yeah. Now you can do five damage, you know. Right. That's it. Being able to recast your spells is very good, and with Breach you can do it infinitely, so... Or not, if, it's not infinite, but like you know, I can cast it for cast the same spell four times. I can cast Seething Song four times. That's pretty good. Just getting it a second <laughs> um, time is pretty good, especially if that's like yeah. the thing that triggers your or like to get Jessica's four will, more. which is like the yeah, correct. Right. Yep. I do want to talk about Invoke Calamity. Is is the other uh, card I really really think is like uh, can be showcased really well in this deck. Hmm. Invoke Calamity is an instant. It's uh, one in four red, which that cost doesn't matter to us. We're mono red. <laughs> 
but it's a, it's an instant. It says you may cast up to two instant and or sorcery spells with total mana value six or less from your graveyard and or hand without paying their mana costs. If those spells would be put into your graveyard, exile them instead, and then exile invoke calamity. Um, so this is instant speed recursion, which really like at a, in a deck where you're trying to win an instant speed a lot of the time can't really be undervalued. It's it's so good. Causes a lot of our kind of two card combos that if we end up tossing a card on turn one or turn two and then on turn four we call it, like you know pitch another piece all of a sudden we have a invoke calamity we can cast those two cards and win the game which is usually two copy spells but i mean that card is just it's just a house and we've i, I think every single time i've won the game i've used it in some way uh, yeah it, with, on its face it's like ugh, five man ugh, that seems like not good but i me knowing the way the deck works and seeing it in action, that yeah, I, I know that it's a good card, and it is. This is probably one of the only places where this card is really gonna see, you know, that kind of play. <clears throat> I remember yeah. uh, when this card first came out. It's been a while, but <laughs> I remember looking at it like, who the fuck is playing this shit? <laughs> you found you found the place yeah. for it. You found the place. Yeah, honestly, it's it, it is just the instant speed nature of it. It just makes it so good. Uh, the fact that you can cast, you know, while you're going through your loop, all of a sudden now you're casting Witch's Mark to get through the, the One Ring. And the way it works with buyback on Reiterate, also very good. So it's a solid card. Another, like, weird include that, you know, maybe not everybody is on it. Some people might play something like Blood Moon over this or maybe just swap it out for more gas. But I have it uh, in there to kind of try to protect me from Force of Wills. It's called Vexing Bobble. It does, uh, it's a new one, and it does kind of... Nambo with the card we just talked about, Invoke Calamity, but it can sacrifice itself. It can draw a card in a pinch. Um, and by the time we cast Invoke Calamity for the, for like the most part for our looping uh, that we're going to talk about later, we'll have infinite mana anyway, so we'll be able to sack this and it won't be an issue for us. It could be an issue on a Storm Turn and ban us tight um, and, and we want to cast Invoke Calamity, so like it, it, there are like very corner cases where I think it could run into, you know, this, uh, this is kind of hurting us a little bit, but I think for the most part it's just going to protect us from Force of Wills. You know, um, I've cast Deflecting Swat in this deck into a Vexing Bobble, knowing it's going to get countered just to get the Rummage trigger and the, then right. the Ashling trigger, whether that was the mana or whatever. But, like, I've done that, and it's it's a good move anyway. It doesn't matter if it resolves. You know, you can just cast it for the trigger. Yeah. Uh, notably, um, just to read it off real fast, uh, real fast uh, Vexing Bobble is a one-mana artifact. It says, whenever a player casts a spell with no mana, we'll spend to cast a counter that spell. It's like Lavinia or Boromir. Uh, it's better than Lavinia because it's like Boromir and the fact that you can sack it. So if you do play this early to stop shenanigans and then somebody tries to go for it and people are like, I can't counter it because of the dumb bobble, you're like, okay, crack it, draw a card. Now you can stop them. I've also been screwed by this card a couple times where people played it early and it just let the combo player win. So yeah, it uh, does you have to be happen. careful. You have to be careful with it for sure. And it, it, it's a double-edged sword too, because if you're if you're playing it early, you're hoping that you st you're stopping some mana, right? Like uh, like I'm gonna play it if I'm pl like going second, you know, to stop players three and four from yeah. dropping a, a mana crypt and a, and a chrome box and stuff like that. And that I think is good thinking most of the time. And but the the problem is is now you've put turn you know player one in such a huge lead, especially if they dump their hand. Uh, so you have to be careful with that. Sometimes it's not a playable card when you need to make sure that you know the table's at least on even footing while you're trying to set your set your board up. It is a card you need to know how to play. It's one it's one generic and it protects you from force of will if if you're playing on your storm turn. It's kind of too good to pass up. The fact that it can cycle itself and draw a card in a pinch is also very good. Not not like a, I think like in auto include. I think that other other people may play this deck and not play that. But I like I said, I think that the benefits outweigh the the cons at this point. Do you um, think it's better I, than like say defense grid? Like you like this over defense grid because I see you're not playing defense grid. A hundred percent. So actually, this slot was defense grid at at one point. Um, me and Kirk both swapped it because we started to realize that you're play you're playing it instant speed. You're trying to win on your opponent's turn a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. So. Defense Grid stops you more, a lot more than Vexing Bobble does. So, like the Defense Grid, you can only play it if you're like, I'm, I'm winning this turn. I'm about to win, right? right? Like that's the only time that Defense Grid is good for you. At that point, you already have what you need to win. You're just protecting yourself, which obviously protection is good, but it's not enough for the card to be in the list. We need more. We need more from our slots right now. That means that it's a good deck. Is that like you know you have this kind of crunch for slots where you need you need your cards to do more. Yeah, card quality is always a concern, but uh, 
Yeah, I, I was just curious if that was a if that was the case. So why don't you run us into combos uh, as those would be considered strengths before we get into the weaknesses of the deck. Uh, so what is the yeah. your your number one combo, the one you're shooting for the most? The biggest combo that we're trying to win the game with uh, in this in this deck is uh, a combo with Ashling Flame Dancer in play. And then we have uh, two copy spells, um, and that can be achieved with one card via Fury Storm. Um, so Fury Storm is two and two red. Um, it says when you cast a spell, copy it for each time you cast you you have cast your commander uh, from the commands on this game. You may choose new targets for the copies. Obviously, if you if Ashling is on the field, you have cast her one time, so it will copy itself at least one time. Uh, and then it says copy target instant or sorcery spell. You may choose new targets for a copy. Um, so obviously, something needs to be on the stack. For this, for you to cast this, um, right. otherwise you cannot cast it. So that's why winning at instant speed with this card is very good. You, you know, you're on your turn and you're storming off and you're just going. You know, you're casting rituals. You got uh, the the Ashling trigger, and sometimes you just have the mana to do it all on your turn, where you put something on the stack, and then you're going to fury storm it. Um, but a lot of times you're just going to leave four mana open. You know, the turn after you play Ashling, and you're going to try to jam this on your opponent's turn whenever you feel like you have a window. You know, notably what it does is you, your bottom copy is targeting whatever's on the stack. When it copies itself, the new copy spell is targeting the first copy spell. So what that does is it, is it creates infinite mage craft triggers because if you first cast Fury Storm, so that's one one rummage or one Ashling trigger, then it copies itself, right? And then so that's another rummage. And then once the, the top copy resolves targeting the bottom copy, now that's another rummage because you've copied a spell. And you copy the copy spell, so there's a new copy spell on the stack, and you target the original copy spell. Warning! And you just continue to... <laughs> Crazy math insert here. <laughs> like... <laughs> and so you just continue to do that, and every time the copy resolves, it becomes a new copy spell. And obviously you've copied something, so it's a Magecraft trigger. So you just keep looping, right? And you keep discarding. And one of the cards in the deck is a Shuffle Titan. It's Cause Luck Butcher of Truth. Um, I'm only running one at the moment, um, but the um, uh, as soon as you discard him, your graveyard will shuffle in. So the idea is, with the four mana that you'll get from your third Ashling trigger, you're going to cast Seething Song or Desperate Ritual are your two instant speed rituals. Um, and they are going to go mana positive. And, you know, you cast them, they go in the bin, and then Kozilek shuffles them back in. And then uh, you cast them again, they go in the bin. Kozilek shuffles, shuffles them back in. You keep, you keep rummaging all the way through... Until you have, you know, theoretically infinite mana. Obviously, this is like non-deterministic because it's possible that you could discard Kozilek before you run into Seething Song enough times that you're just like, you could get called for slow play, um, stuff like that, because you're looping without n anything happening. This is why this is not the best tournament deck because it's technically non-deterministic, even though it is like mathematically, you're gonna run into Seething Song enough times to go to go infinite. It's just gonna take you a long time. So if there you're, if you're playing casually we, with your buddies, figured out though is that if you have a Bergy on the field, you don't even need the seething songs. You just need a lightning bolt because Bergy right, yeah, make the mana every time you cast it. Right. Yeah. So after you're done looping your rituals for infinite mana, or if you have Bergy on the field, then you just you cast lightning bolt, and then I have another spicy include called uh, fiery temper, which is a uh, two red and a generic. And it um, has madness for a single red. So when you discard it, you can cast it, and it says deal three damage to any target. That, and then lightning bolt, and then the third one is twin shot oh. sniper, which can be used to uh, get around rule of law. Really, is the reason why it's in the in the deck. Yeah. It's the main it's reason. Channel it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, if you have storm killing artists in play during this magecraft loop, you do create infinite treasures. Um, so you can use that infinite treasures to a channel twin shot sniper. You can also kind of you can you can run. Glenhorn Buccaneer to try to get through Rule of Law as well. I think that's an effective card for that. I personally thought that Glenhorn didn't do enough for me, um, and I ran Stormkill Artist instead, and, and just am rolling with Twin Shot Sniper as my way around Rule of Law. Because Twin Shot Sniper still has utility. If you're really in trouble, you can throw it down on the board, and, and it's a blocker, and it still does the two damage when it TBs, or you can channel it if you need to get rid of something. Well, notably, the channel so, yeah, is a discard, so um, it is something that you can get into your hand because of the Ashling thing, and then you can channel it, it goes to the bin, and it still gets shuffled back in, so it can be part of your loop. It costs right. two instead of one, but you know if you've already made, quote-unquote, infinite, infinite mana, trips, this is yeah. still going to work anyway. Correct. Then you're just you're just killing everybody with that. That's the main combo. Is the is that double copy spell combo to create those infinite magecraft triggers rummage now, through your deck? Now you can do that with more than just the Fury Storm, though, right? Like you have how many? Correct. Other yeah, we have. 
you know, we have spells <laughs> that I know one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven other ways to copy spells. So that includes Pyromancer's Goggles, which is it's kind of a mid card, but it does really like add to our redundancy and it's um like makes it a little easier if you if you can get it down the turn before or if you just have a lot of mana or if you played a trees in a or whatever which that that does happen but yeah there's a there's a lot of copy spells fork reverberate like all those and we obviously have like a lot of combos that involve reiterate but yeah all these all these copy spells if you just use two of them rather than fury storm so you know something's on the stack you use fork and you target whatever's on the stack and then hold priority you cast reverberate on your fork that achieves the same exact stack interaction that that fury storm does on its own we have the one card combo and then all of a sudden we have 11 other things in our deck that can also be used you know we have to have two of them but when we're rummaging a lot of times we'll run into two of them um and if we have a recursion a way to recur the first one or something like a conspiracy theorist in play then boom you've got your combo yeah, you um, leave it in the exile. Potentially like, the four mana to cast it, yeah. is basically a, a second hand, so to speak. You you can build that up while you're rummaging, and it's none of that stuff is going to get shuffled back in. It's just going to be there for when you need it. So eventually you've hit you've hit the one and it's sitting there, and then you keep going, you hit the other, and then you bam, go ahead. It is also a May. You don't have to exile the thing. So if you you know you want to pitch your your Kozilek, pitch it, put it in the yep. bin, shuffle it back in. Make sure that you don't accidentally exile Titan, which would be a huge pain pain for this deck. Um, that that'd be the only reason you'd want to run two, I, I would say. Um, right, and actually, the the reason I'm not running two, since we did talk about the loop, I should talk about why I'm not running two. So I was on two for a, a little bit in this deck. You know, some people might still say it's it's correct to run two. I I think that this this combo works a little bit better. So instead of running two, I'm running Shenanigans which shenanigans is one in a red for a sorcery. It says destroy target artifact, but it has dredge one. The big like fear, right, is that your last card in your deck is your is your shuffle titan. So you rummage, you, you discard, and you draw your, your shuffle titan, right? And then your next rummage, because it's infinite, right? So you're, you're getting your next rummage right after that. So you, you discard your shuffle titan, but that trigger goes on the stack. You still have to draw before that, that shuffle happens. So you would deck yourself if it was the last mm-hmm. card in your deck. And if you're looping something infinitely that is technically non-deterministic, you could do it 500 times. So one in 99 chance is kind of that's not that's bad for us. We can't do that. We're going to run into it at some point if we are infinite, infinitely looping this. Like I said, what Shenanigans does is if sh- you know, obviously, as soon as we get Shenanigans in our hand, we usually want to discard it if we're looping. If we're not looping, it's a little di- it's a little different. We can use the card as a trigger. But if if we are looping, we immediately want to put it in the bin. So if we know the Shuffle Titan is the last card in the deck, because obviously we have everything else in the graveyard, if we know it's the last card in the deck, we instead dredge on that draw. So the, the dredge we, it replaces the draw, we get the shenanigans back to our hand, then the Shuffle Titan trigger can, can resolve on the stack. So yes. that's kind of huge. It, it, yeah. it does free up a slot to something that actually gives us tr- a trigger uh, in shenanigans. So Well, and also, it's, it's a, a removal spell, right? Right, it does destroy an artifact, which, like, that's not nothing. It's not going to kill the One Ring, which is, like, you know, that's a bummer. But you see some, see one of your opponents, he's choked on mana, and he's got this Arcane Signet that's su- super important to him. Yeah, you can use it on that. All right, so uh, that's the main combo. Uh, are all the other combos kind of leading to the same thing, or are there some that maybe win on a different axis? The rest of the combos are really just more basic mono-red stuff. Um, and with the introduction of Pinnacle Monk... That kind of has expanded, I think. Uh, Pinnacle Monk is the new MDFC. Here, I can read him too. He's three and two red. He has Prowess, which isn't super important. It, it does matter, but it's not like the most important thing. Uh, but his other text is, when Pinnacle Monk enters the battlefield, return target uh, instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand. The reason why this is playable at five mana is because on the back it's a land, uh, uh, an untapped land at that. Um, it, on the back, it is Mystic Peak, and it says as Mystic Peak enters the battlefield, you may pay three life. If you don't, it enters the battlefield tapped, and it taps for a red. So the three life is, yeah. yeah, the three life is really nothing. Obviously, uh, you know we do run trees in Sogar, but the deck isn't like getting trees in Sogar or we're losing. So uh, it's a good piece, and we're fine with paying the three life to have this come in untapped. Yeah. Um, but we're also able to loop with this if it's not a land already on the field. So there's a couple of, of like 
basic mono red combos like dual, dual caster mage combo. Um, there's some combos that involve Jessica's Will and Reiterate. You can also use Seething Song if you have some cost reducers or mana generators like you know, like Bergy or, or Ruby Medallion or whatever it is. But yeah, you can create infinite mana that way, and that also causes infinite Ashling triggers because you're casting copying uh, okay. sorceries all, over and over again. But obviously, dual caster mage is like that's like the classic mono red win con. You can also do some really cool things with Pinnacle Monk that are that are all in my primer, and I think they're like just kind of hilarious that. These are all cards you're playing anyway. These do sound like, you know, far-fetched combos, but there's a lot of redundancy. And you're, like any, like I said, anyway, you're playing these cards regardless. So if you have Pinnacle Monk, uh, Dockside, and Twin Flame, you can use the Strive ability on Twin Flame. So you cast, as long as Dockside makes at least five treasures, you cast Twin Flame on Dockside, use the Strive ability on Pinnacle Monk, right? And then so Twin Flame resolves, it goes to the bin, it copies those two things, Pinnacle Monk ETBs, you get Twin Flame back. Dockside ETBs, you get five treasures. You do it again. Now you have two hasty tokens, and you went mana neutral. So stuff like that, I think, is just like, it's wow, like we weird, can just do that. It's a weirder yeah. uh, dual caster combo, but it works. <laughs> right, yeah. We, we can just do that because Pinnacle Monk exists, which I think is really cool. You can also do like just straight up Twin Flame or Molten Duplication with like two uh, mana generators or, or cost reducers. Like So if you have Burgi in play... And you have Ruby Medallion in play, which obviously, like I said, magical Christmas lands in some senses, but like there are redundancies to these pieces, like Ste- Runaway Steamkin, you know, cast Twin Flame targeting your your Pinnacle Monk, right? And then so that triggers Burger, you get a red, and it was reduced by one by, by Ruby Medallion. So you cast it for one, you got a red back, and it goes to the bin. New Pinnacle Monk ETVs, it gives you back Twin Flame, and now you're you're just casting it again. Uh, Storm Kill Artist also does this. You know, use Storm Killers in the same way Bergy or Ruby Medallion would work, you know, and Runaway Steamkin is the other one. So there's four of those pieces, you just need two of them in play. Like I said, they're all already in the deck for their own reasons, but they right. you're you're trying to put these in play anyway. I guess the question is, is what do ogres have? Ogres have layers. <laughs> <laughs> a, la- a, good layers. Deck. <laughs> a good deck is a good layers. Deck, yep. <laughs> yeah. Our main commander copy spell combo, we can win through the one ring. And the main way that we do that is we use Invoke Calamity, and we target Witch's Mark on the bottom of the stack, and then Reiterate on the top of the stack. All right. So, and the way that Reiterate works with Buyback and and Invoke Calamity. Uh, remember when I read Invoke Calamity, it says if those spells would be put into your graveyard, exile them instead. But you're casting the spells with Invoke Calamity, so you cast Reiterate, so you do have the the uh, ability to pay for Buyback. So if you generate infinite mana for your from your rituals, you cast Invoke Calamity on Witch's Mark underneath, reiterate on top, you pay for buyback on your reiterate, that goes back to your hand instead of getting exiled. And you can do that because you're casting it. Because Invoke Calamity specifically says if those spells will be put into your graveyard, exile them instead, that's why this works. With Flashback, it just says exile them instead. It cannot go back to your hand, period. So past in Flames, this would not work because Flashback replaces anything. But Invoke Calamity just says if it would go to your graveyard, exile it. But if you're buying it back, it's not going to your graveyard, so it can go to your hand. Sure. And then you cast Reiterate with Buyback infinitely because you have infinite mana already on Witch's Mark. Uh, and Witch's Mark is is one in a red for a sorcery. Remember, Invoke Calamity can cast sorceries at instant speed. Uh, this is the reason why it's in the deck. It's a well-layered card. It says you may discard a card if you do draw two cards. So it does it does have its own rummaging effect on it. So you're putting two cards away to, to get two new cards, plus it's an Ashling trigger. Um, but the big thing is it's, it, it says create a Wicked Roll token attached to up to one target creature you control. All right, and then in parentheses it says, if you control another roll on it, put that one into the graveyard. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one. When this aura is put into a graveyard, each opponent loses one life. Yeah. So instead of damage, it is loss of life, and this is going to happen infinitely because you're going to cast Reiterate with buyback over and over on this Witch's Mark, so you're going to get infinite copies of it, and you're going to put infinite roll tokens on whatever creature you want, probably Ashling. Well, not infinite. You're going to infinitely put one and remove one, and each time you yeah, remove yeah. it, it and hits the bin and drains everybody for a life. Notably, gets for around life. one ring protection because it's the loss one. of life and not damage. Like, there's two other ways to get around it, I guess. One of them is to, to, to go card positive, which there's a you know there's a way for that in my primer. You can see it. Um, you just go card positive using Invoke Calamity on bonus round and demand answers, and you're able to you know basically build your whole hand, have infinite mana because Ashling retains your mana, and you get to like sculpt your hand and have you could have 80 cards in your hand by the time 
that person untaps with infinite mana. So there's nothing that they can do if you do that. That can't happen in tournaments because it's non-deterministic. You would have to play that out to know which cards you ha you do have in your hand. Um, you would have infinite mana, but you you don't know which cards you'd have in your hand. You can't have all of them because of the discards. Mm -hmm. So it is like uh, it is kind of a catch-22 with that one. I, if you're playing casually, I would just suggest doing that maybe like or or use Witch's Mark if you want to have like a for sure closer. Um, but if you're if your friends are okay with you shortcutting something like that, um, realistically that's a fine way to go about it. The other way is by using Flaring Pain, and Flaring Pain is a uh, one in a red instant that says damage can't be prevented this turn, and then it has flashback of just a red. So the fact that it's a one mana instant flashback is nice because you use it to create triggers uh, from from uh, Ashling. So you can basically get two triggers for three mana here. Not the best rate, but when you're going to get four mana on the on the third trigger, it's not also not the worst rate because it says damage can't be prevented this turn, it, it gets around the One Ring's protection as well. You can either just slot in something like Delayed Bat Blast Fireball to loop. I prefer this other way that you can use to kill your kill the table with Ashling's second ability. So if you use Twin Flame or Molten Duplication, or Heat Shimmer would also work. If any of those three are in the bin with uh, Reiterate, you can do the same trick with Invoke Calamity to cast them at instant speed. And you put the Twin Flame on the stack targeting Ashling, and then you reiterate and do your buyback, you know, shenanigans um, to create a copy of that, and that targets Ashling, right? So you cast reiterate. That's a, a trigger. Obviously, you're going to rummage, but you know that's going to be one of your two. And then it, when it copies the spell, it's also going to trigger. So that's two. And then you're going to copy Ashling. You sack the old Ashling to the legend legend rule. You have a new token copy of Ashling that has has reset her mage craft triggers, and you have reiterate back in your hand with infinite mana. So you cast Reiterate again with buyback on the existing Twin Flame on the stack, and you cr you create one trigger by casting it, another trigger by copying it, and then it's back in your hand, and you're uh, you're doing two damage that way, and then you're resetting her by using you know that copy of Twin Flame is going to target Ashling again, sacking the old one, bringing in a new one with reset Magecraft triggers. So you can do that, and you're going to do two damage on the second one every time, I mean, you're, and you're going to get two triggers, one from casting. And then the second from copying on reiterate, and then it's going to end up back in your hand from buyback, and you can just do that infinitely to create infinite uh, two, two damage to each opponent. So basically, there's a billion ways to make infinite mana and do infinite damage. Yeah, there's a lot of ways, and it's <laughs> it's all stuff that you're playing anyway. So right. it, it and does that's the best like part. having that layered uh, redundancy is is definitely good. So obviously strong in the sense that it has all of that resiliency and redundancy and uh, nothing really costs all that much uh, as far as you know in the grand scheme of things like your highest CMC of anything that you're doing is like five so you're probably yeah, you're never casting the Titan yeah so that, that that doesn't really count as 10 mana on paper but you like I said never cast in it so so moving from there then I guess what would you say the biggest weaknesses in your testing have been? Obviously, mono red. You can never have enough colors in CDH. Everybody wants access to more of the card pool, so mono red does cause us, you know, some issues. Like we do go help bent pretty easily. We don't like to use stuff like impulse draw. We are running Jessica's will because it's just too good. Right. But impulse draw like uh, causes us to like have this chance of exiling the Titan, which would be a huge problem for our main combo. So even though that's one of our big tools in red, we don't, we can't really, we don't have access to it. That's one of the reasons why a card like File of Galadriel, I think, is is important, even though it's a little bit overpriced. It still does tap for mana, and it it has this ability to get us more cards in our hand. When we need them in our hand, we can't put them in exile because it's just too risky. The other big thing is um, during our our main commander copy combo, uh, we can really, really get got by a card like Mindbreak Trap. The problem with Mindbreak Trap is is you need to you generally need to sack the bobble at some point to cast Invoke Calamity. So at some point you're gonna you're gonna get rid of that, and Shut there is down. gonna be a window for them to yeah to exile every single spell in the stack, including your your stack of copies that you need to make sure that you can continue looping. So Mindbreak Trap is a huge problem. Like that's while you while you're going while you're like if you're already going and you think you're gonna win, Mindbreak Trap is the is the card that's gonna get you. It's gonna get it's it's really gonna you know come out of nowhere and get you while you're already thinking that you're winning. Dranith is the one that's just going to slow you down outright from the start. So um, obviously we, we use our commander for a lot. I talked about at the beginning how much text is on there and how much we like everything that she does. Not having access to her is just a huge problem, but like a lot of decks. 
but being mono red, we don't have as many tools to get around it. We do have a lot of three damage spells like Lightning Bolt, Abrade, Galvanic Discharge. Um, I'm even running Pyrokinesis and stuff. Like, you know, I'm I am really trying to do my best to make sure that I can get rid of that if I if it's on the field. But it's 100 cards in your deck. It's Singleton, and there's not a lot of tutors in the deck, so. You could be top decking for a little bit before you really run into something that can get rid of it, or, or you're going to be relying on an opponent to get rid of it for you. Rummaging as well, uh, a graveyard hate is probably a big thing. Yeah, Dothy would be a huge problem for us, but like I covered at the beginning, that two damage just it. Same with Orgish Bellmasters, like those, both of those cards are are hard to for us to combo through, but because we just get rid of them naturally on accident. I mean, that's just amazing. Obviously, a card like Rest in Peace or, you know, like Notion Thief, like like those cards that don't see as much play but are still very devastating to a lot of decks, those cards are still going to get you. But the more common ones, like Bowmasters and, and Dothy, you can at least just get rid of with the commander. What about like those effects stuff like are bad for us, but, yeah. Ristic or Mystic? Like, have you run into those where that's been a problem, where you're just drawing people way too many cards and then they have answers? On your storm turn, that can be those can be definitely issues. In the loop, it's not an issue because you're going to rummage until you find Red Blast and you have Magecraft mana to just uh, Red Blast or Pyroblast. Um, really are your your best friends there. Or I do have Chaos Warp in the deck. Um, I am running Chaos Warp. I don't love the card. I'll be honest with you, it's not a good card. But you do need to be able to get rid of Ristic Studies on your storm turn. So you know, and a lot of times you do go excess mana. So the three mana, it, it's not it's not ideal. But it will get rid of more stuff than something... Uh, I think we were running uh, Zoyawa's Justice for a little bit. Um, that will get rid of the One Ring, but it won't get rid of Aristic Study. So What about... Um, with, what was that? Like my Wild Magic Surge, I think? It was like two mana instead of three, but it basically was Chaos Warp? My biggest fear with that one, especially if we're mainly using it to get rid of Aristic Studies and Mystic Remoras, is that players don't have that many enchantments in their deck. So if you hit Ristic Study, you could flip into Mystic Remora, and sure. that happens kind of a bit, because the way that would Wild Magic Surge is, Surge is worded is exile the, the thing, I think, type. and you get the same permanent type, mm -hmm. so you flip until you get the same permanent type. So if you're, if someone's running four enchantments and two of them are Ristic and Mystic, like you're one out of three chance you're going to you know run yeah. into the other. Warp is pretty... It's pretty benign. It, like that one card that you flip, if that's their Aether Flux Reservoir and they have 50 li 51 life and they can just blast you to death, that's just hilarious. <laughs> like, you just gotta laugh when stuff like that happens and understand yeah. that that's not a problem with your deck or your play. That's just sometimes you, you know, yeah. sometimes you eat the bar and sometimes the bar eats you, as <laughs> Sam Elliott said in The Big Lebowski. You gotta, you gotta be able to live with that sometimes. Not every so, deck is perfect, especially in Mono Red. What about, like, rule of law effects? Like, uh, does that seems like that Huge would problem. be a killer. Yeah, I was going to say. Huge problem. Yeah. Deafening silence is also uh, an issue for us. You know, any type of rule law. They're, they're seeing a lot less play. Deafening silence is the kind of the exception that does come up a lot. Uh, we can win through deafening silence, though, uh, and, and rule of law, because y you have Fury Storm. So the idea is you get Storm Killing Artists in play. If that's already in play, you can cast Fury Storm. That's one spell. Um, you're going to... Uh, create infinite mana, you're going to do your loop, and you can kill the table with Twin Shot Sniper. So it's more set up, but you can win through it. So you just need the specific card of Storm Kiln, which, mono red, all you got is gamble, but you are digging a lot. So um, a card like Imperial Recruiter also, also can go get it. Rule you know, of Law typically pisses off everybody at the table, so eventually it's going to get removed, and you may have your window then. But I was just curious. Right, yeah. Yeah, maybe somebody removes it to, you know, you can just hold your cards and just sit and wait, Somebody removes it, goes for their win, everybody tries to counter them or doesn't, and you can just jam your win on top of theirs. That's that's the beauty of this deck, is that even stuff that, like, okay, it's going to slow us down, but it's going to slow everyone down, when that thing gets removed, even if we can't remove it, we might be able to just jam on top of whatever anyone else is doing. Instant speed, really, yeah, it's just so good. So, I mean, it sounds like there are a couple weaknesses, but you've, you've done your best to shore them up. So, next question... Um, the cards that are on your considering list, are those cards that you've already tried? Are those cards that maybe you're thinking about trying? Are, are, are there are, are there cards you're actively like looking at like, eh, this is kind of on like the edge of being cut and maybe I want to slot something else in? A lot of the cards that I'm considering I've at least played a little bit with. 
some cards not on my considering list that I've just cut from considering at all I've played with. So I, I you know, I haven't done that much testing with the deck, but I've done a lot of gold fishing as well. That kind of helped me sort out what I wanted, what I didn't want. But cards like Harmonic Prodigy and Containment Construct really are the two like engine type cards that are really close to being in the deck. Um, when I did my last kind of like not major overhaul, but like I did, I swapped out like seven or eight cards. The, one of the main focuses of that draft was I want more triggers. I, I want more instants and sorceries. I want to make sure that I'm I'm triggering my commander every single turn that she that she's in play. And uh, I'm I'm getting that that rummage, the damage, and the mana. Like I want those triggers. So I kind of just cut down a little bit on creatures, which Harmonic Prodigy, which doubles our commander's triggers, our, our rummages, would be really good. Except, you know, if we're not triggering it initially, then doubling it does nothing. A double of zero is still zero. Containment construct is along the same vein of uh, con- uh, Conspiracy Theorist. It says uh, whenever you discard a card, you may exile that card from your graveyard. If you do, you may play that card this turn. So on the surface, this looks like it's a better Conspiracy Theorist because it, it exiles everything you discard. So if you use Faithless Looting, both those cards you can put in the Containment Construct zone. And it will let you play lands. So like, those two things sound really good, but it's a 2-1, and it's an artifact creature. So it feeds Dockside, and it dies to Bowmasters. So with those two things, I'm just like, well, the Conspiracy Theorist is a 2-2. And it's not an artifact, so I That's don't bad. really need to play the lands generally. Yeah, like usually uh, it doesn't matter. I'm I'm just looking to see you know what I can cast next from that pile. So it's one of those things where first glance maybe you're thinking, well, containment construct is like an upgrade on conspiracy theories, yeah, right? That, that but, was exactly what I was thinking. I was like, honestly, I'd probably play this still, but I get I, I get what you're saying. Uh, feeding docs on so is bad, and then. Uh, it being able to just instantly die to an ETB and a Bowmaster is a, it's like, wow, I paid the mana, and it did fuck all. If if I had a 101st slot in this deck, Containment Construct would probably be the slot. So right. it is it is super, super close. Like, I want that card in the deck, but I also want 43 instants and sorceries. So, you know, that's those two th- ideas are butting heads. So you can only, you know, you can only play so much, so... Right. Uh, if you're cutting cards that you think are good for the deck, that means the deck is good. You're just your, increasing core your cards level. are good enough. Yep. The other one is Glinthorn, and I wouldn't fault anyone for playing Glinthorn. I personally, like I said, I found my other way around Rule of Law that I like better. If you're running Glinthorn, you're probably running it over Twin Shot Sniper, which you and know, it's if just, you think it's that's just better. Essentially, like if you're going through your rummaging loop, you're you're killing the table because it's pinging. Right, because it's going to ping everybody. And if you're playing in a tournament, maybe this is the way to go so that you can ensure that you kill everybody, but then this kind of makes it a three-card combo with Fury Storm because you have to have it in play. So I just think it slows you down too much, and we have our other avenues of getting around Rule of Law that are better layered, just a, a little bit better. Have you thought about like any of the pinging cards? Like every time you cast an instant or sorcery, ping everyone for a damage? Uh, yeah, I just think slots are too tight. You're not going to be killing everybody with your manual storm. Your, your manual storm is an avenue to dig to your combo. Well, the trouble with those um, is they, they usually don't trigger off copies. I was just curious. Yeah, it's, it would be like overall good. It just wouldn't be good enough. Uh, the other one I like, you know, is very very close is Mizzix's Mastery. Three recursion spells I'm running are Breach, Pass in Flames, and Invoke Calamity. Obviously, we talked about Invoke Calamity's importance, and and Breach is just kind of too good because you could like, okay, I'm, I've got 15 cards in my graveyard. I'm gonna cast this Jessica's Will four times. Like that right. is just kind of just too good. Pass in Flames over Mizzix's Mastery. The real the real reason I'm I'm running it that way because Mizzix's Mastery again is a very good card with a super high ceiling. It had, like that overload is just so good. One Mizzix's Mastery, obviously sorcery. So is Pass in Flames, but Pass in Flames is, is easily discarded early in the game if you don't need it. Like, if I pitch a Pass in Flames, I'm like, cool, have that for later. It has flashback stapled on it. The versatility of it being like, okay, I just can get rid of it, and then I can use it when I need to, um, is pretty good. Obviously, you need to have an excess of mana, really, to use it, because it costs five mana to flashback. Then you can start ritualing off, though, a lot of times. Like, okay, I'm going to pay five mana for this Pass in Flames. I have three mana left over. I'm going to Seething Song now. And then I'm going to copy that, and I'm, you know, I'm going to do all this stuff where I now all of a sudden I have 15 mana. That that happened often enough, and I've 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 worked through those lines in my Circara deck before, so I've kind of been more comfortable with Past and Flames. With Mizzix's Mastery, if you pitch it, 
it's more or less gone forever unless you loop with sure. Kozilek. And that ceiling, that overload, when you're storming off, oh, I have Mizzix's Mastery in hand, I can just overload every, overload it, and now I have two copy spells in the bin, and I can just go infinite that way, right? That's really good. But seven mana... and Christmas land. Right, yeah. And it, it's that's the only time it's good. With Pass and Flames, it's like, oh, I have it in my early hand. It, it, this is discard fodder for the Faithless Looting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play... To, to start digging for my real shit that I need to, to go off. Flaring Pain was the other one. I, that's not currently in my list. I'm running Witch's Mark instead. Those two, I think, are really interchangeable if you're like you're following the, the combo I talked about earlier with Twin Flaming Ashling over and over again to to reset or triggers. That's kind of it. I think like in terms of like cards that I think might one day not be in the deck or, or could be kind of maybe on the chopping block a little bit, uh, one is Pyromancer's Goggles. It's a five mana artifact, but it does like okay. I use it to cast fork. Now all of a sudden, I'm winning the game. So while you're storming off, it doesn't matter because you just end up with so much mana if you're able to cast a ritual, copy it, and and do stuff like that, or cast Jessica's will multiple times. Like which is what you're aiming to do a lot of the time. It's not like this is like a corner case. You're trying to do this. You're trying to make this happen. Maybe sometimes you're able to just like oh, I have seven mana. I'm gonna play Pyromancer's goggles, and I got two left over, and I have the the pyromancer's goggles so i have three mana i can use the pyromancer's goggles to cast fork now i win it's a good card in in what we're trying to do but five mana is just a lot so So, i could see that not being there at some point speaking of hypotheticals like the next question i have is kind of i've posed this uh in the last couple or the last deck tech i think that i did with kirk and, and some of the ones that i did with some of the popper people if you could you know, not necessarily like design a card, but if you had a wish list of like the card that you would like would just be the thing that just like threw this over the top or, you know, just a redundant piece or whatever. Like, is there a card you can think of or like a, an, another effect that's in the deck that you would just like more of that like if they printed, you, it would just help this deck out immensely? So there's a card in here uh, called Return the Favor. Uh, it's two red for an instant and it has spree. Uh, and it's two modes are plus one and plus one. They're both plus one. The first one says copy target instant, sp- instant spell, sorcery spell, activated ability, or triggered ability. You may choose new targets for the copy. The second one says uh, change the target of target spell with a single target. So something like this uh, that had recursion and a copy spell pasted on it. Like obviously the change the target is also good. You can use it as interaction. It's like a three mana deflecting spot. Yeah. Um, but if this was copy on top, or cast target spell from your graveyard, you know, without paying its mana cost, even if it was three or less, it's, it costs three mana, and it's, you know, you're getting a three or less, or a four or less, or whatever it is. If, if it was something like that, I mean, God, that's, that's, that's what we want right there. Um, where we have modes that are, both of the modes are very good for us. Really, or, like, recursion and like copy an, are uh, two big uh, ones. Like another copy of, like, Pinnacle Monk as well, maybe something else that's in mono red that can recur... Yeah, if there was a three mana Pinnacle Monk with without the the land on the back, I probably would still play that too. It'd be hard to pass it up for sure. Do you have any plans to maybe submit it to the database? I already did submit it to the database. the oh, The nice. database right now is uh kind of in backlog mode. Their last update was in they, their la- their last deadline was in April, um, oh. and they still have not done the update for that deadline. Oh, yeah, so, there was a lot of drama with um, them, and we don't need to go into that. But yeah, it kind of yeah yeah flux. it's just. Yeah, I did. I did submit it. I think. I think it is like at least worthy of Brewers Corner. You know, get more eyes on the deck, show people what it can do, and and you know, there's. I have, like I said, I have a big primer. There is a like a channel in the Mono Red Discord. So if you're in the Mono Red Discord, uh, there is an Ashling channel. I have gotten a lot of really good help from those people. That's where I got the shenanigans trick. Uh, that's also where I got the Witch's Mark trick. Um, me and Kirk also discussed that with me as well, but I did see it there and the flaring pain. Just that card suggestion, not the not the uh, the combo that I had with it. But I mean, it's like raising um, the kid; it takes a village, right? Like my synthesis yeah, yeah. did not start off the way it is. I got help from the Discord and or Reddit. So yeah, yeah. Even in my primer, I do credit I credit both Kirk and the Mono Red Discord because both of those help me, you know, yeah, shape shoot, what it shoot is. Shoot me the and, link to the that Discord. I, I will put it in the show notes as well so yeah. that uh, people can check that out if they're interested. Um, yeah, and that was, that was actually my follow-up question was, um, how was it right in a primer? Because I, I know you've had lots of decks and I can't recall you really going deep on a primer. Uh, how was that I experience? Have a, I have a few primers. I have a primer for my Windgrace deck, which it's shorter because the deck only does one thing. So there's only 
one thing to do to talk about. I have some other primers, like my I, I wrote a primer for my Gerard deck and stuff. So I have like a little bit of experience with, you know, trying to write out the things that you need to know. With this deck, it really kind of felt pretty natural. Like your main thing that you want to do is you want to talk about the commander. Why is the commander good? There's a lot of stuff to talk about there. I just went through the abilities and talked about the one card combo. From there, you just got to talk about how how do you win the game with it? You know, how do you win the game with it? That's the main thing that people really need to know if they're going to pick it up. My explanations are pretty long, but hopefully they're just detailed enough. You know, hopefully you have a little bit of fun rolling through this and trying to put this together in your brain so you can, you know, play with it. But I think obviously the best teacher is to, you know, have the primer out maybe and just goldfish with it and have fun. Single card discussions from there was I never know what to pull from my inclusions because I like in my brain everything that I included is is great because mm-hmm. I've already gone through the process of of vetting the card and decided why it's good. So that kind of is harder for me. But I did go kind of pretty big on the exclusions on why I'm not running stuff like Glenhorn and Tibalt's Trickery and Containment Construct um, and and the second Shuffle Titan. So I wanted to make sure that people understood why those cards are not in the deck. That's why we have discussions like this with people, because I've already asked you a few questions about, like, why aren't you running this card? Or why have, have you thought about pingers? Have you thought about this or that? And that's why you have those things in the primer to say, this is why we don't, or this is why we do. But that's been my experience with writing primers as well. It's just, you know, introduce the, the concept, the commander. This is why we like X, Y, Z. This is why we're running it, because you may argue, why not run this better mono red commander? well because this one does this this and this and yada yada so it's just thinking about what people would ask if they were new to the deck and or uh what they would challenge you with as far as like why aren't you running this thing that i feel is an auto include you're stupid why and you know you just talk about that with well this is why and uh, you've done a good job of that throughout our conversation here as well so but yeah Yeah. out of the primers i've seen like i knew you had primers prior but like that one seems like it's very much more detailed than some of the others I've seen. I have the same thing. You know, there's some primers that are actually detailed, and then there's some that's just like the combos, and that's it. And that's just for me to remember what the fuck the combos are because I haven't played the deck in a couple weeks or whatever the case may be. Got, got to write so. it down for your own your own brain as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's so many combos yeah, and, think, and there's so many decks. Like it's hard to remember everything all the time, especially the older you get. It's crazy. The other thing about writing this all out, like obviously me and. When I first started building it, I was building it for the, the channel game. That was the reason that I was building the deck. My first initial playing the deck, I played Kirk's deck. I literally played his list, and I, I just really liked it. I was like, this is really fun. And then, so, as I started to get a feel for it, I built my, like, I obviously took his, and I kind of changed it. I think we're, like, 10 to 12 cards different at this point, something like that. We're, like, significantly different enough that it's, a di- like, a slightly different deck, but it really is, like, the same, uh, same ways core. to win the game. Yeah, same same ways to win. Um, so we had discussed it a lot, and I think that kind of helped me. Like, okay, when you're discussing it and you're seeing it written down, these ideas, especially from Kirk, like he he showed me the Fury Storm combo. He, uh, you know, talked to me about why is why is that card good in the deck? Why are a lot of the cards good in the deck? If I asked him, you know, uh, about a card, he would you know immediately come back with that. So I was thinking about the questions I was asking Kirk when I was writing it. You know, big ups to Kirk. It, he, it's... he is a, the ultimate brewer. <laughs> oh, that man. We're like the same. I think he's like a year or two older than me. We're like basically the same age. We've been basically playing for the same amount of time, roughly. But he pulls shit out of his ass. And I'm just like, damn, how did you think of that? Like, I didn't even see it. I read this card and I was over here and he reads it and he's way the fuck over here three steps ahead of me. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. When he when he told me about the one card combo with Fury Storm and, and the double copy combo i did like i didn't see either of that either of those things when i first read it or or nor even when i first looked at trying to put a list together i was like okay well this is just mono red storm i'm just gonna throw a bunch of stuff in there and see if i can you know rummage my way to to a combo and even in that situation i might have put in some stuff like pingers and stuff but now i have these layered combos that are so in like ingrained just because we've had these discussions so the, the primer is really an extension of that kind of I, I think writing open it down discussion too, with a lot of people that um, it's a it's a proven thing with like edu- it's an educational tool like writing oh, yeah. it down is always going to cement it in your brain more than just talking so for me oh, if i'm a I math really... teacher i know that <laughs> i i teach teach high school math i tell them you gotta write it down like yeah. if you don't write it down you're never gonna remember it nope. you, gotta, you gotta put it on paper it's, there is a reason why people use sticky notes and put them on their monitor or write a, a list for shopping because you're gonna get there and your brain's gonna go 
and you're not going to remember yep. what the fuck you even came there for. So writing it down is helpful. I was a big proponent of that because I was always very wordy. I did very well in English and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I wrote a blog for fucking like 15 years. I, I've let it lapse the last couple years, but it was a thing. Regularly, I was writing all the fuck time and writing shit down like just helps you bring out stuff in your brain that you don't even really realize is there until you actually started putting words to paper. Yeah, some of these lines that I've I've run into definitely would not have I wouldn't have thought of them if I didn't have a primer if I wasn't writing this out. So yeah, cause and, you have and to even think though, about how to explain it, it, it like it's what's what's the thing on Reddit? Explain it like I'm five. You've got to yeah. write this shit out to explain it to the layman, lay, the the most layman terms possible, so that anybody who reads it is like, oh, okay, now I understand. And that's why when I do my combos, I'll do a breakdown of like each step, like. Play this, do this, or these are the requirements. This much mana, this thing in your hand, this thing on the field, then activate this thing, do this thing, pay this, do that, sacrifice this, draw a card, do this, do that, and then bam. And then people can be like, oh, okay, it, it makes sense now. Yeah, so I have one last question for you before we wrap this up, and that is, where does this deck rank amongst decks that you've played or built in recent memory like i know that you've brewed a lot for the channel as far as like one-offs things that maybe you never played again but yeah you have like a stable of these are my favorite decks you play them all the time uh to the point where sometimes you annoy me because you play the same shit all the time but that's okay so that's part of playing together for five years here <laughs> yeah I, I suppose so you get used to everybody's decks and you're like oh this one again god <sighs> <laughs> it, 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 thankfully, you don't play like Karkas Sakashima or like one of those decks that I really fucking hate. But anyhow, uh, again, the question is, uh, how does this rank among decks that you've built in like you know the last couple years? Definitely like the best deck I think I've built for the channel by far. I really like that Agatha deck that I built a while back. I think that actually has a little bit more legs than I gave it credit for when I was trying to build it, and it ended up being pretty good be just because of that natural overrun ability yeah i think this is easily the best deck i've built for the channel probably like really up there with like the last few years what i've what uh, decks that i've put together in terms of paper i haven't had like a new new deck in like paper in a while i, I guess i just did i built garuda in paper which i had had on moxfield and had played for a while so it's gonna be one of my first like new decks in paper that i'm i've put together because i'm I'm currently in the process of get, getting all the cards together and, and throwing it in paper, so I'm sure we'll see more of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's okay. You'll be you'll be annoyed of it by the end of it, but <laughs> I, I you know it, it's just been really fun to brew it up, especially like the collaboration with Kirk and and the uh, huh. the Monterey so, Discord. Just see, so much secret secret conversation you were not prior to, uh, privy to that happened uh, prior to that gameplay stream was that he actually told me like I'm gonna throw Joey this list because I think he's gonna like it. And also so that maybe he builds it in paper and we can see him play something new for a while. <laughs> so, he was on the same page as me, like, man, we're tired of, of, of Salvala and, and Sir Kara and fucking uh, <laughs> whatever else. Like, let's get him something new to play. So uh, yeah. it was all a big ass conspiracy to lead you up to this point. But hey, you know, all it right. worked. There it we worked. Go. You got passionate about it. You made a good deck. Uh, it's on the, it may make its way to the database at some point. I hope so. Uh, that'd be my first one so yeah that's cool though so yeah uh, that pretty much wraps up everything that i had to ask uh do you have any final thoughts anything else you want to share about it before we sign off here uh really just if you like mono red if you or even if you just like you know interesting decks that have cool combos in them with a lot of redundancy and a lot of like ability to to siphon through your deck until you find what you need if you like that kind of style that aggressive style then Storm. this is a deck that you you can pick up and just have some fun, you know? Who knows if it's it's not, like, going to be... I don't think it's cause this is going to be top 16 in any tournaments. Maybe it will. Maybe we'll see some surprise, really cool finishes. And I think that it has that kind of power, but I just don't think it's, like... It might not be consistent enough for that. But it is going to be, re like, really fun to play with your friends in casual. Uh, or, you know, casual CDH, which is really just, you know, tabletop stuff. Um, and it, you're going to have a lot of fun. It's, it is going to win 25% plus of its games, I think. It's... It's just gonna have a tough time against stuff like Blue Farm and you know those really uh, those really big you know titans of the of the format. Well, I mean, um, don't don't sell it too short. It's a spoiler, I guess. But you know, this last gameplay video I just released, it won on turn two. So I mean, it's not not CDH. It, it's definitely oh yeah, it, there. It's yeah, it is CDH for sure. It can it like I like I said, I wouldn't be surprised to see it in a top sixteen at some point because it has the, every the step of the of way with the this. slow play thing is probably the only thing that's holding it back. 
But not tournament even as a play would issue. be yeah. Because like right, it, yeah, can, but... it can do the non-deterministic back and forth. Like we saw Kirk do it on stream where he like we're like we're fucked, and then he's just like, well, got to pass. I I didn't didn't get there. He still managed yeah. to like win on the next turn or whatever. But that's not the point. The point is that there are decks that are gonna just be non-deterministic and maybe don't get there. And in tournament play, you're under REL rules, fucking timing restrictions, all that stuff. There's judges that can be called to say, hey, this guy's slow playing. You can get uh, warnings and or eliminations because of that so in that regard it may not be the best most winningest tournament deck but there may be somebody out there that figures out a way to streamline it even more and maybe there is a way for it i mean magda won 100 percent four zero, and then fucking you know took down a tournament a couple years back so i mean anything's possible that's not to say that it can't uh and being discouraged because people are like oh this isn't cedh or they don't like it fuck them play it anyway <laughs> see if you can yeah. make it the other thing is this deck has has surprised me every step of the way when I first started building it, it surprised me because Kirk gave me gave me these uh, these awesome ideas, and and it surprised me with winning. It won a won a game on that stream, and every time I've brought it out, I've I've won a game, one of the three or four that we've played. So you know, you're gonna get there. You're gonna find you're gonna find Fury Storm with your commander in play. It's gonna happen at some point, <laughs> or you're gonna have two copy spells. You know, who who knows? And or it's gonna worst keep case scenario, you're people. gonna be stuck under a Dranith or whatever, and you're just gonna dual caster Twin Flame and win anyway. You know? Yeah, you know there there are ways around the the Dranith, You know you can win around that thing. It's the beauty of of having a good uh, card quality deck. All right, well, Joey, thank you so much for uh, joining me here and uh, filling in for Kirk for an episode. And uh, it was great to talk about this list. I hope that people that see this uh, will be interested. And uh, again, we'll have I'll have some gameplay videos uh, in the description. We'll have the deck list itself, and uh, we'll try to get you a, a link to the Mono Red Discord if you guys want to check that out. You can also always join my Discord. It's free to join. There are no strings attached. Come in. You can play the games with us. You can get in our uh, Brewmaster chat, etc., to uh, discuss your builds. Uh, also, if you like the content, you want to throw us a buck or two, Got a Patreon. It's in the link or in the show notes below. Um, every little bit helps, and uh, we do have some cool benefits. Uh, you can get play mats, t-shirts. Uh, I do one-on-one -on -one deck building help. So yeah, anything anything helps. But with that said, we're gonna sign off here. We'll see you guys next time we get one of these podcast episodes out. I know it hasn't been very regular, but it is as regular as I can make it, given real life stuff. But guaranteed, you will see some more gameplay uh, videos here uh, in, in the near future. We, we're definitely still sticking on that uh, weekly. So we're all just good. trying to be more regular, you know. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> shitty jokes. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly, <laughs> <metamucil> commercial. <laughs> all right. You, you, everybody have a good day, week, month, rest of your year, life, whatever. We'll see you next time. Take care.